Let's practice identifying aesthetic features in these quotations and try to explain what they position readers to understand about Miller's message or what ideas Miller is privileging. We also need to make sure that we are practicing explaining how these aesthetic features position readers. So how do we analyze? Well, we just need to follow these simple steps. Firstly, have a clear response or idea about the theme in your head. Then you need to search for the best and most discerning quotations that prove your response. Pick over the language and pull them apart into chunks. Then you need to identify the aesthetic features that are in the quotations and identify what these techniques help readers to understand about the theme, response or your topic sentence. Then you need to get to work explaining. So let's have a look at how we do the explaining. When we are looking to analyse, we need to start by actively having a response or an idea about a theme in our head. For the first example, our response is going to be that Miller privileges the idea that the community of Salem is founded on hypocrisy. We need to keep this in the forefront of our mind when analysing so that we know what we are proving. Once we have this, we can search for a suitable and discerning quotation. In this case, here's one I've prepared earlier. There are wheels within wheels in this village and fires within fires, which was said by Goody Putnam. Now, firstly, when I see this quotation, I would notice that it is not explicit in its representation of an idea, which might tip me off that Mrs. Putnam's words have a deeper level of meaning. I can then look closer and see that Miller is using a metaphor to describe the village. In my head, I then work out that Mrs. Putnam's words refers to the idea that nothing is ever as it appears on the surface, and there are often ulterior motives behind what Salem might say in public. Sure, I could just write this down, but then I'm not actually analysing because I am not explaining how Miller is positioning audiences. Instead, I would just be stating what he positions audiences to understand. Now remember that your paragraphs need to go what, so what. So, just stating the what doesn't go deep enough. Let's pull apart the quotation and see how we could go about explaining how Miller is positioning us to understand something about the theme of community. Firstly, we notice that Miller uses the initial metaphor of a machine, being the wheels within wheels, to indicate that one wheel may be driven by another inside it. This relates to the idea of characters driving each other to destruction, as well as hidden motivations. We can see how this links back to our initial thought about this quotation. The metaphor is then extended to incorporate the idea of fires within fires. In this, Miller, through Mrs Putnam, is again metaphorically indicating that what is seen on the surface is not necessarily the truth, but in the second iteration, the author also connotes hell and sin, suggesting to the other characters present that Salem is more sinful and less pure than they would have themselves believe. We can explain that the metaphor positions readers to understand that characters who involve themselves in the witch hunt, including Mrs Putnam, are aware of their own duplicity, yet continue to condemn others because the characters, and Mrs Putnam in particular, is aware that there are hidden motivations and hypocrisies in the community. Now, this quotation has some other important lines around it, and the context that she brings her words into is quite important, because we can see that Miller is trying to tell us about the community and its people very early on. Readers can also understand through the context of the conversation, being the history of peopling this province, that Miller is highlighting the longevity of this practice amongst the members of the Salem community. So how did we put that all together and where did we get our ideas from? You can see here that we have used a clear topic sentence that integrates our initial idea or the what about the quotation, as well as integrating part of our response. The quotation is then introduced appropriately and the person saying it is identified. We then tell our marker which aesthetic feature we have identified and are going to discuss and analyse so that we are showing our understanding. We then explain what this metaphor means within the play and how Miller is using that to position readers to understand that the community is based on hypocrisy. This means that we are proving our response and topic sentence. From here, we continue to support our point by telling our marker another aesthetic feature that is used and what ideas this gives the audience. Notice the way that we requote the quotation to physically break it down and show our marker our ideas. Finally, we start to pull this all together to explain very clearly what message Miller is trying to give to the reader and how this is done. Then, to continue supporting our analysis to the very end and furthering our previous analysis, we tell our marker about the importance of the context of the quotation and how this helps to position audiences to understand what idea Miller is privileging in the play. As you can see, there is quite a bit of thought process that goes into this, but if you walk through it logically, you can ensure that you are creating effective and discerning analysis of aesthetic features. That's dimension three. Let's have a look at another quotation and some analysis for it. Now that we've had a bit of practice at the full thought process, let's abbreviate it a little. We are going to use the next quotation to prove that Miller privileges the idea that personal integrity is important by focusing on its opposites. 
so this is our response that we need to keep at the forefront of our mind. Here's the quotation. My name is good in the village, I will not have my name soiled. Goody Proctor is a gossiping liar, said by Abigail. The exclamation points in the quotation suggest that Abigail is spitting the accusation out, and this reveals her bitterness as a character, as well as the venom she puts into defending her own name. Miller also characterises her as someone without personal integrity by having Abigail state that she will not have her name soiled, implying that she will resist any attack on her reputation, even if it is true. Obviously, this line becomes ironic to readers later in the play as readers know of Abigail's sin, further demonstrating that Abigail is without her integrity by accusing a woman whose husband she committed adultery with. It also shows the importance of a person's reputation in Salem by the forceful rejection of any conjecture about her reputation, even in a private setting. So how do we write this? Miller privileges the idea that personal integrity is important by focusing on Abigail and her willingness to protect her reputation by any means. When confronted by Paris about her name in the village, Abigail forcefully replies, My name is good in the village. I will not have my name soiled. Goody Proctor is a gossiping liar. The exclamation points in the quotation suggest that Abigail is spitting the accusation out, revealing her bitterness as a character as well as the venom that she puts into defending her name. Through this line, Miller characterises her as someone without personal integrity, by having Abigail state that she will not have her name soiled, rather than offering any contrary point, implying that she will resist any attack on her reputation, even if it is true. Readers understand the irony of this line later in the play as readers know of Abigail's sin, further demonstrating that Abigail is without her integrity as she accuses a woman whose husband she has committed adultery with. The characterisation of Abigail shows the importance of a person's reputation in Salem through the forceful rejection of any conjecture about her reputation, even in a private setting. Can you see here how we are picking each part of the quotation apart and turning it over to explain in detail how readers are positioned to understand a certain perspective that Miller is creating and privileging in his play? We are also clearly showing our marker which aesthetic features we are using and how these are positioning readers. We can't just say that this line proves this. We need to give our own evidence and explanations that show where these ideas can be found directly in the play and which aesthetic features are being used to position us. Again, notice the way that we reuse salient parts of the quotation here to help us prove our point. Let's look at some other examples of aesthetic features. For these ones, I'm going to go over the quotation and how you could analyse it. You'll then need to think for yourself how you can turn this into a proper paragraph. Because it is so important to the process of analysis, we'll look briefly at the response or topic sentence that we would be proving for each. For this next quotation, our response would be that Miller privileges the idea that diabolism is used as a tool to achieve selfish ends. Let's have a look at the quotation. The use of colour in the quotation through black and reddish enhances the threat that Abigail is making. She promises to visit the girls in the black of the night, and this obviously has sinister connotations of evil. She also promises some reddish work, connoting that she will make the girls bleed if they discuss their dancing in the woods. This imagery works with Miller's language choice of pointy reckoning that links to the motif of the devil throughout the play, showing readers that Abigail is actively invoking the other's fear of the devil in order to secure the girls' public agreement. Readers know that Abigail's ultimate mission is one of a selfish desire regarding John Proctor and thus Miller's use of diabolism on a smaller scale implies the extensive nature of this idea within the community, because Abigail is only a teenager. When we write this out in an essay, we need to think about the parts that are most salient in proving our response and how we would adapt this analysis to suit a topic sentence. Reread the work here and have a go at changing it to a proper paragraph structure. Which bits are the most important? Which bits would you get rid of? And what else might you add to keep analysing aesthetic features? Let's have a look at another quotation. This time we'll analyse how it helps us prove that the community of Salem is founded on hypocrisy. The quotation? I have trouble enough without I come five mile to hear him preach only hellfire and bloody damnation. Take it to heart, Mr. Paris, there are many others who stay away from the church because you hardly ever mention God anymore, said by Proctor. Proctor is addressing two issues here the hypocrisy of Salem and his own distaste for Paris as a minister. When he says Paris only preaches hellfire and bloody damnation, Miller is pointing out that the focus of religion in Salem has shifted, ironically, towards accusation and judgment and away from the love and goodness which Christianity is supposed to promote. This shift in focus to damnation is the foundation of the village's desire to hang the witches. People now suspect, gossip and point at one another, a very cruel interpretation of the Bible. Proctor finishes by warning Paris that he is not the only villager who believes the minister is addressing the wrong aspects of their religion. Miller is characterising both Paris and Proctor in these lines. Paris is characterised as hypocritical and a negative influence on the community, while Proctor is characterised as an outsider. The final sentence has an edge of ironic humour to it. 
It's odd, don't you think, that Proctor is talking about a minister who doesn't mention God anymore? Just a side note. In another context, and responding to another question or discussing another point about the community, we might also be able to say that when Proctor comes five mile into the village, he is faced with hellfire. And it is this hellfire, heat and pressure that puts him to the test when he is in the village. Like, you know, a crucible, which might just be like the symbolic title. Just a thought for you. Finally, let's have a look at how we can pull a quotation apart completely in order to provide deep and thorough analysis. The quotation that we'll look at here comes from the opening commentary. Let's look at it in detail. We start off. Perhaps the most obvious idea that Miller introduces in his initial commentary is that Salem is a community that is run on fear. We have a clear topic sentence here. Miller describes the edge of the wilderness as close by. The American continent stretched endlessly west and it was full of mystery for them. It stood dark and threatening over the shoulders night and day, for out of it Indian tribe marauded from time to time. So this is our quotation that is appropriately introduced. Then we have a little bit of so what, so that we can tip our marker off, that we understand what this quotation means. We can't just leave it here though, because otherwise we are just sort of re-explaining the quotation. So we go on. Positioning us to understand the great fear of the unknown that later leeches into the play through diabolism, Miller shows audiences the character's fear through the description of dark threatening, which is reinforced by the personification of fear and the wilderness standing over Salem. In presenting this imagery, audiences understand why characters might be so manipulated by fear. So in this part, we have our first aesthetic feature, and we also have our explanation, our so what, or a how. How does that position us? Notice again that we are re-quoting the quote to show salient points. And then we go on from here. Miller reinforces these initial ideas through the line, Salem folk believed that the virgin forest was the devil's last preserve, his home base and the citadel of his final stand. The irony and juxtaposition of the virgin forest housing the devil aligns with the ideals of purity, but also demonstrates just how deeply the fear runs through the community and introduces the concept that symbolic purity and immorality are not so far from each other. So again, you can see that we have another supporting aesthetic feature and we continue to make sure that we are explaining how the aesthetic feature positions the readers in more detail. Then we keep analysing to the end through the sentence. This early commentary combined with the action of the play illustrates how fear and hysteria mixed with an atmosphere of persecution may lead to tragically unjust consequences. Again, you can see how we have picked apart the quotation, exactly which aesthetic features we are using and explaining, and then we have made it clear how these have of positioned readers. We are not just retelling the story, nor are we just saying what the quotation says in other words. We are re-quoting to show salient points and then we are explaining exactly how the author has positioned us to understand a certain idea. So how do we analyse? Let's go over these again. Firstly, you need a clear response or idea about the theme in your head and you need to make sure it is always there and always at the forefront of your mind because everything that you do with aesthetic features needs to link back to this. Then you need to search for the best and most discerning quotations that prove your response. Don't look for ones that have the most aesthetic features. You want the best quotations that prove your response. Once you have your quotation, you need to pick over the language and pull it apart into chunks. Then you can identify what aesthetic features are used and how these techniques help readers to understand more about the theme or your response or your topic sentence. Then you get to the work explaining how readers are positioned and how this proves your response and your point. When you look closely at Miller's language and analyse the ideas within it, you can easily see the ways that audiences are purposefully positioned. Remember that Miller's play is not only allegorical, it is also designed to teach moral lessons. Once we can see the moral lessons ourselves, we need to pick apart Miller's work and show our marker exactly how these moral lessons are privileged and conveyed. 